control over a robot. And we're discussing maybe being able to uh, control the chicken tractor from from the cloud. Huh. Yes, yes. So we, we actually uh, built this tool called uh, Rivis Hub. And so we have a website. I can drop the link to it in the chat please. on uh, Jitsi and over on Slack in the random channel as well. But uh, when you go through all of that, it'll give you permission. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll, you'll see a device that gets shared with you called Celeste. And so anytime we're driving around now, from any time you come back, you'll be able to see what we're doing with it. Um, and so you get this three-dimensional uh, feed from it. Um, it's the visualization I set up. It's actually using an RVIS file to generate this dynamically. So any RVIS file you upload, um, we're able to render it pretty much. And then uh, what you're seeing here is the, the black and white uh, floor tiles here. That's kind of uh, coming from G mapping uh, for, for like kind of a floor plan mapping. And then the things that you see coming up are the color and RGB data from a point cloud sensor. Um, and, and that data is being collected using, our, it's called a RTAB map, which is a SLAM mapping tool in the ROS ecosystem. And then um, you can see the driving. So we actually have the robot driving, and those red arrows are kind of the best, I think, 50 or so odometry points. And then the pink lines you see were the plans that it had uh, while it was driving. So anytime we drop in a new marker to go toward, um, it'll it'll redraw that pink, pink line. And so you can see all these different topics of data uh, flying around. And, we can, and we're actually credentialing your user account based off of all the topics and devices and who you are. And so we're actually also adding in end-to-end -end cryptography. So if you want to be able to have a high degree of security so you know th so that you know that we can't even observe the content of your messages, uh, you can be able to do that as well. And so we're getting pretty close to doing a public release of this. Um, so this is, this is actually our, our V1 system, but we're actually going to be releasing the version 2 uh, about the next month. And it's all so open source. For people who want to play. Yeah, so the, all of the parts that uh, are required to get your robot activated are totally open source. And then all the libraries you need to get your data in and out of the cloud are open source. We unfortunately had to do a lot of proprietary work in the cloud to be able to scale the solution to you know, hundreds of thousands of users. So we're not able to open source a lot of that work. But we are able to give you a lot of the gateway tools uh, to do this for a very small scale on-premise installation. Mm -hmm. Now, is the current... What you're showing on the screen is that is that real or is this just yeah virtual? yeah so we're driving right now and actually here if I, I can go take you over to the robot real quick let me uh, see if I can turn on my video camera huh. okay so let's see I don't know if you can see this my computer might freak out when I walk around but we're actually using this robot from a group called uh, Ubiquity Robotics mm -hmm. uh, and they're building it's actually about the same price range as a turtle bot uh, too. And this little, oh yeah, so where I started was about over here. We have this front desk in our lobby here. And so we were driving uh, down through the lobby. Mm -hmm. And so the robots come to a rest over here by the refrigerator. Oh, yeah, it's good thing I can over here. One of the cables came. But uh, so it's just a little, uh, little piece of equipment that, um, that the Ubiquity team built. Uh, they gave us an early prototype. And so it's, a, it's actually a pretty good little workhorse. Um, it runs for about eight hours or so mm -hmm. um, on a single charge, and then uh, and then once it's all charged up, um, you can you can actually load it up with quite a bit of weight for such a small platform. It'll actually carry about a hundred kilograms. Um, it's a tractor. Can you explain the sensors that are on top of it? Yeah, certainly. So um, it's kind of got these. Uh, first off, our local motion is all um, through these hub motors which are actually pretty much the same things that you see on those uh, little balancing uh, hoverboard things. And then up front, we have all of the uh, motor control circuitry. And uh, this thing is very forgiving. I have done a lot of dumb things to it, <laughs> and it has survived a lot of abuse. And then uh, up front, I have a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and this, this Raspberry Pi actually has an up-facing camera uh, on this blue uh, 3D printed mount here. And it's actually looking up and feeling So we actually have some up-facing cameras that are looking at these um, Aruco markers up here, mm. and it actually can get uh, additional odometry data from that for very cheap. Um, and then, kind of on the more expensive side, we just kind of slapped on a joystick, and then there's another Raspberry Pi back here. And this is a, an Xcon point cloud sensor, 
and then up here is a scant sweep uh, LiDAR unit. Um, so actually right now when I was driving around, we were only using the point cloud sensor and then just raw odometry from the tires. Um, so all of that was being stitched just with the tire odometry. Um, the point cloud sensor, how does that work? What is that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so it actually, um, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but when we get really close up to it, you'll see that there is a, a red light, possibly, or a white light. Uh huh. Um, so it actually is projecting a dot pattern in infrared. Uh huh. Um, and so these, unfortunately, this particular sensor doesn't work very well outdoors mm -hmm. uh, because of the way it has to project. And so it only really goes about 30 feet indoors. Uh -huh. And so, so it's projecting uh, infrared light on, on this, center, on this uh, circle here. And then it's gathering the infrared light back on this, uh, this other uh, optical uh, element. And then there's an RGB camera in the middle of all of that. Yeah. So, that, so this is about five years old, uh, this sensor. But a lot of the point cloud sensors that are coming out now um, actually can work indoor and outdoor. Um, notably, the Intel RealSense. Uh, the RealSense actually has, the way they, they solved the problem is they actually picked up two infrared cameras, and they actually do a stereo infrared matching. And then if you go indoors with it at all, or if it gets dark enough, it'll switch to the projected pattern. And they're only about, I think, $200, depending on which sensor you're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, so nice. we've, we've played around with, a bit with those. Another good option for outdoor use is the... So the, the nice thing about point cloud sensors is they don't require a huge amount of processing power to mm -hmm. uh, get you the 3D data. Of course, processing the data can be a little hard. Um, but, uh, of course, other things out there are like the, um, the uh, Z, uh, ZED stereo camera uh, from Stereo Labs. Uh, that camera is really great for outdoor use, but it requires uh, like an NVIDIA graphics card to get it to work uh, mm -hmm. well, at least. Okay. Um, so that's a little bit higher on the on the performance on the computer performance. Um, yeah, Matt, can I ask you to just uh, to take notes on this in the working document? Yep, I just put those sensors in there. Okay. okay. So yeah. I mean, all of those sensors, and actually the the um, so Xteon is sadly uh, their business got acquired by Apple or something like that many years ago. So they stopped selling the sensor. But I, it actually would probably be a great sensor if you want the down facing camera that looked at your plants and could be a three D image. It would actually be perfect for that because it's probably shielded a bit from the sunlight. Yeah. Excellent. Um, let's see, Matt. Can you fill me in on? As far as Alan, Alan, are you, are you, um, you asked Alan to, to showcase some of the, the potential sensing hardware or tell me more? Or how oh, yeah. is Alan, how will yeah. Alan be involved Definitely. in a, anything related to our open source ecology robotic tractor? Um, yeah, so more specifically? I, I've been watching your post on, on Discourse and I just thought it was yeah. good. Uh, you guys were working on a very interesting problem. I just wanted to show you what, what we're working on over at Red Hub. And of course, we we love working on robots in general. So, yeah, um, happy to help out any way we can on the software for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what? Sorry, what company are you with? Oh yes, yeah, so our company is called ROS Hub. Uh, you okay. can find us at roshub.io. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. And I I also maintain a couple of the ROS packages for web development tools, um, among other things. So. All right. I have a couple of uh, point cloud tools here and there. Um, actually, I don't, actually, I think I just posted one of my one of my random perceptive projects recently, which was more of an interactive art thing. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Thank you, um, Matt. That's cool. Thanks, Alan. I think that's awesome. Thanks yeah. for your work. In this dead yeah. silence right here, let's let's go more. So, let's see. Um, so Jeremy is coming to the actual build event, but next weekend, is that correct? Jeremy, welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so I talked to Matt, and yeah. it seems like the automation portion will be later. So I think we're planning to come the following weekend. Okay. And Matt, you're arriving tomorrow, correct? Tomorrow, hopefully, um, you know, uh, five to eight-ish. I'm about eight hours away now. Okay, you're driving? Yeah. 
From where? From Washington, Washington State? State? Wow, that's a, that's an epic journey. Okay, where are you at right now? You you look like you're in a is that a road stop? A hotel. Hotel. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> road stop. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a little more civilized than a road stop. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so so let's let's uh, just uh, check in on what what else uh, do we want to cover today regarding this meeting? Where what are some of the updates? Um, just some of the updates on the schedule. So we talked a little bit about um, so trying to get the machine working. It sounds like Monday, um, you know, maybe early a Sunday, the yeah. tractor will be driving around. Yeah. So then um, Tuesday we can start installing some of the electronics and then maybe to characterize the vehicle. How does it drive? What's the response? Mm -hmm. And then um, Thursday I'll be going to St. Louis uh, for a meetup down there. And then Friday, Jeremy and I will come back up um, to load software, do the testing and the rest mm -hmm. of the information. And then the meetup, you're going to actually, it's going to be a hackathon? You're going to actually work on the software? Well, Jeremy suggested maybe a hackathon this Saturday, which is a pretty cool idea. Oh. Um, try to work on some of the software packages to get those together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Very good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, um, we're going to be building starting on Friday. The Thursday is the training day as far as what we do here. Um, so what else? What else to to cover? Um, I've got the e-stop uh, box. The e-stop electronics and the box, all the hardware is getting shipped to your place. It'll probably be there uh, Thursday or Friday. Mm -hmm. So um, sometime it would be nice to. I mean, we can start putting together some of the electronics and testing those on the machine just manually. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, looking forward to the build. We'll start that. Yeah. Thursday. As far as the electronics, the just the basics is just getting you know taking out the solenoids and making sure that you can activate them with the you know with the software. That's step one. Um, yep. Could go we'll go with that. But yeah, that actually works well. So because we were talking about using one of our older tractors, but we actually are want to strip its tracks. We want to reuse the tracks of that, and because we were building the two tractors, one is the tiny one, but the second one is the larger 64 horsepower, which we're gonna need the tracks from the machine we were gonna use for experiments. I'm going to cannibalize it, which is good. It'll save us save us a lot of time, actually, so it works out. Um, yeah. 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 Um, so as far as um, your software task that you need to uh, help with? Sorry. Uh, who, who was that? Was that a question to to Matt? Or Jeremy. So uh, we started the Ian started this um, kind of I don't know if you did not the the GitHub Ross uh, Ross Ag page, but that's where Ian started putting everything. It looks like uh, the parts that are missing there are the uh, for the simulation we haven't. That. So there's no little plug-in for GPS or IMU. Uh, I was going to start working on that. I do have, I have the uh, like you, like you. We have a Raspberry Pi. And uh, I've got Ross on. I just got the GPS and I knew from that. Gotcha. And so I think I'll try. I kind of picked out the packages that I need. Uh, I think the IMU is a little more complicated because it's uh, a spy bus, a little bitty thing. Uh, oh, I see. So I don't know if that will happen in if that'll happen. So Matt and I were just talking before everybody got on about trying to locate one that might be more loss ready. Uh, the Razor IMU from SparkFun is uh, really well supported, uh, last I checked. Uh, let me see if it's still uh, being sold. I know they've gone through a couple different versions of it. Okay. Uh, but it's a, I believe it's a 9 degree of freedom, so you get uh, accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers. 
Let's see, I see one of them is retired now. Let's see which one's active. That's where you got this, right, man? Um, I got it from Robo Shop, Robot Shop, but um, that razor, I think, would be a nice sign to have. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out which one is the current, current supported. So the nice thing about the, the older razor, at least, was that it had some sort of processing on board on an Atmega. Um, so all you had to do was flash up an Arduino sketch onto it, and then over on Rose, there was just a, a driver for it. Um, and then there was a slightly involved tuning process, which would be kind of hard on a tractor to characterize it. But uh, when it's free floating, it's pretty easy. Um, you have to, you just have to rotate it a bunch to get it to uh, be comfortable with whatever magnetic field you have it bolted to, essentially. Like a hard iron, some kind of iron calibration process. Exactly. Yeah, it'll it'll try to take any that you have just because of whatever your structure is uh, out of it. Um, but here, so I found the package, drop it in the chat here. So I've had a lot of success with this in the past. Uh, if we can find that, that's a supported board. I see the razor in the nine uh, Ross Wiki page. Yeah, and so it seems like SparkFun retired it. I can't quite track down the replacement part yet. Actually, it might be the one that you already have. It looks about the same size. Did you just have both a uh, like USB and a um, little locking SD card and everything? Uh, this one? No, this is this is just SPI and uh, ice cream. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, you might check out the one I just dropped you. Um, I found I found the, what appears to be the replacement for this. So no idea if it's still supported. But that's the sort of thing, I mean, that's definitely the sort of package that I'd be happy maintaining is uh, maybe supporting this in, in the old space. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can get that one on order. Uh, I have deep enough, I can just grab one and try it out myself. Can you send a link to the one that you'd like to try? Yeah, I've prop, uh, it should be prop number 14,001 on Spark Month. I put it in this cat. Retired, so get it from a different place. Oh, or no, no. This this one is in stock. Okay. Um. Yeah, this one's in style. Okay. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll have to find out if it's still supported or talk the same protocol or whatnot. Looks like it's no longer. Um, oh, okay. It's still Arduino compatible. Yeah, it's not like a great option if you don't want to have to do all of uh, all of the centrifuging yourself at least. Agree. So, um, would we have to like unmount it and then do magnetometer? Because Matt and I talked about just doing something simple at first with the. Um, I don't know how good the magnetometer is on it, but we were thinking about just getting raw heading. I don't think we really need it. The speed we're going, and I don't know how much heading uh, accuracy we actually need. Yeah. I think the, the one thing that's nice about the IMU is that you can get heading data without having to move. Whereas on a GPS, you have to, of course, move like 5, 10 feet before you get mm. a good solid heading fix. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean, is that I'm almost be inclined just to. Uh, Use that that um, channel directly. The yaw heading, the yaw, the absolute uh, yeah, absolute heading reference. So. So they yeah they make a really nice it's a, a, a navigation a couple of navigation tools made by ClearPath that interface um, package. Uh, but um, 
it will, this package allows you to set the margin of error, essentially, on every axis. And then you can also tell it which axis to, to make uh, the most use of out of the sensor, out of the IQ. You're talking about ROS package? Yeah, there's a ROS package. It's maintained by ClearPath Robotics, and it will it'll do sensor fusion. I think it's called uh, Robot. Is it robot, like now? robot localization? Yes, I think it's a, uh, you'll see like they can take in like several sensors, uh, like the GPS IA. And Are you talking about the EKF? The I think it's a common filter. So there, there's been a several iterations of the package, and it kind of depends. Uh, so there's, there's like five different packages out there um, that do different parts of the common filtering and the uh, nav stack parts. So, okay. Yeah, I think it's robot localization, which include, should include the, um, the various data. Yes, it is. Yeah, so it includes EKF uh, localization and UKF localization. Right. Which, depending on how you set things up, uh, is a good approach. Um, and so the, the cool thing about this stack is that you can have, I believe, an arbitrary number of odometry, IMU, or uh, or 3D, or like uh, GPS sensors. You can have as many as you want, whereas the older ones could only have one of each. So the, um, the uh, packages I was planning on using was the NEMA NAPSAT driver, the, the GPS common so that gives me um, that gives me odometry from NAVSAT fix, and then um, the NAVSAC, of course. Yeah, it can be a little bit of a mess, but <laughs> depending on exactly your sensors, because um, all of the, the sensors end up boxing you in on which package you're going to have to go with. Yeah. yeah that, that sounds like a reasonable approach for sure. And then there's uh, the um, robot pose you can. Is that the one you're talking about? Oh, no, you go. You meant the whole thing. Yeah, Robot Pose EKF, I think, is one of the older ones. So I've, I've actually, I, I think I've ended up using almost all of these. It just depends on exactly which sensors you have. Yeah. So it, it's probably going to be pretty simple at first. I think, like, like I said, I think I might just use um, GPS for position and just directly use the yaw channel off the end view. Uh, um, unless they have like a boiler angle or some kind of um, filtered output, that, that would be nice. Yeah, it looks like Robot Pose EKF can take your. Uh, well, they have a they have a guide in here for setting it up with the GPS, so that looks like a good a good approach to begin with. I know that the um, the uh, larger one, the uh, EKF localization or UKF, that just takes a ton of tuning. Yeah, I don't think we need, we're going pretty slow, and uh, we're, uh, I don't know how how much you guys think we're concerned about heading. Um, Martin, you mentioned that uh, one of the tractors can go five miles an hour or so. The tractor that we I mean, use will have a maximum speed of nine in series operation and parallel operation it's got 4.5 miles per hour but you can go anywhere from 0 to 4.5 that's engine operation solar operation is one foot per minute that's cool. yeah I mean the biggest thing with heading is of course that over long distance you, you get trip um, I mean that, that's something you'll find out over time for sure but correct me if I'm wrong Matt and Marcy, uh, are we just trying to move, I mean, we just want to move the tractor around the field, but we don't necessarily, we're not doing rows or anything. Like that. No rows, 50 by 300 field and staying within that boundary back and forth. That's all we need. 
50, so, your, so our row is 50 foot wide. So the only thing, I mean, this is all localization. The only thing we haven't really talked about is how to, uh, what kind of navigation. What, uh, you mentioned some waypoint mode, Matt. What, what package is that? Uh, Matt, paste the link of what you're looking at. system that works, we can then start plugging into the various navigation tools and then of course cleaning up the signal. Um, I think that Ubiquity, they did it really well. They, they made this tool called Loop Basic that doesn't require nearly as much configuration as um, as Move Base does. So once you, of course, once you have uh, command velocity working and your sensor fusion going, then you can start navigating based off of a map and doing waypoints. Um, but move base requires a really detailed map as well as uh, uh, it needs a lot of information about the size of your robot. And move basic just kind of assumes your robot has no size <laughs> and only drives in perfectly straight lines. Uh, so it's pretty simplified. So ubiquity robotics thinks that? Yeah, I think it should be in the packages. They have a couple other, like they have a lot of Raspberry Pi support packages for like the Raspberry Pi Cam and things like that as well. But their nav stack is really clean and very simple. Um, so you don't have to do as much configuration on day one at least to get it to just generate the command velocities. And then it's interchangeable with the more complicated move base. So when you have a really good robot model and you have enough sensors to build a um, a map to navigate from, then you can switch over to it. But Move Basic doesn't require a map at all. So it's not, gonna, it's not necessarily going to do map avoidance um, on that at the level. Okay. So, Jeremy, I just posted the waypoint follower. Chat. Okay. Alan, have you seen cool. anybody use um, that? Um, we're using Mavlink. And yes. Mich yeah. So from, I've seen Mavlink used in drones a lot, of course. Um, I've never seen it used on a on a small rope on a. Um, a terrestrial robot, I guess. Oh, I like the way this is a nice waypoint uh, tool. And so I don't, I don't have any direct experience, sadly, with Mavlink myself. Yeah, that's the 
good, man. I think uh, uh, I get that set up. Uh, so you're gonna order the Miami U. Yep, it's gone. It's getting shipped to your house. Oh, okay. So we'll have that. And which I that was the uh, oh the razor from Sparkling. Cool. I'm gonna have to run, guys. But it was really nice meeting you all. And uh, let me know if you have any questions with, about the Razer IME stack. I'm definitely uh, interested in trying to keep that package up to date if it is behind uh, for any reason. Yeah. Oh, Paul was the maintainer. Nice to meet you all. Okay. All right. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, Matt. Uh, Paul Boucher, uh is a maintainer of that Razer. Or is an author, rather. The one he was talking about. So we should be able to hit up Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun. I think it'll be fun. That's a good one to use in in the future if you want to control the bucket. It'd be nice to have it out there anyway. Yeah. Oh, to put on the bucket. That's future work. It's scope creep. I've heard that a lot. Yep. <laughs> All right. I think I have some good packages to install on the pie. It'll be, uh, I guess, where the rubber meets the road will be <laughs> when we get, get out there. It's going to be hard to. Uh, I'll try to get the sim going, but my. Uh, I, I talked to a couple people. I don't know that I'm going to have so much as a, a, a hackathon as it's going to be a one-man hack. <laughs> mm -hmm. I talked to one of my buddies, and he was like, well, I'm working on something this weekend. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Always starts with one, and we'll see if the, the metal hits the road in this case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who are the two fellow Jitsters on it? Is that Lex and and Josh? Or are we being spied on by Google? So I mean, hey, sorry. A bit, I'm not I'm not spying you guys, I'm sorry. I was at work and everyone was loud so I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. And I got here later. <laughs> I'm sorry if you felt I was spying on you. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah, I'm Shaven. I'm from Indianapolis. And yeah, I'm currently walking home, so. And it's raining, so. I'm sorry about the disturbance, but yeah. I was really interested in this project because I am currently working on an agricultural robot. Really? And and we have a Yamaha Volvo Green truck. And we're trying to make it autonomously. So yeah. Um, let's see, Matt. Can you make sure that you catch catch his email? Do you have it, or what was your name again? Uh, I'm Sohin. Uh, my email address uh, would be S S O H I N at outlook.com and I'm sorry I just got the link from Ross yeah uh, community or whatever it is I'm sorry I'm just uh, I don't that, know I don't remember yeah name. I guess that but, internet is working yeah. uh, it was I got the uh, I have the email, uh, email uh, signed up my email yeah. signed up for the like, you know is forward. that um sorry just so, to repeat that s as in sam s as in sam O H as in home, I N as in Nancy, at yep. at where o Outlook. Outlook. Outlook dot com. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
So yeah. We might want to see um, we could collaborate on some of the the track and the autonomous um, movement. Uh, what what kind of tell us more a little bit about your system that you're trying to develop? Uh, well, I li I literally just like uh, Yamaha just gave us the robot. I mean the the car right now. So we're trying to figure out different ways to make it run auto. Sorry. Uh, make it turn. So each row is 30 feet wide. So, and the robot itself would be 70 feet wide. I uh, mean, 70 inches. My bad. I'm sorry. Uh huh. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some to the uh, inch system. Anyways, uh, so we need to turn the robot after a thousand feet and make it uh, make a U turn and continue on the. Uh, row right beside it, mm -hmm. so it's gonna have be like a U-turn, and then it would traverse a thousand more feet, and then another U-turn. So that's our task, uh, and we're, we're planning to compete uh, for the Agbar Challenge, which takes place over here in Indiana. It's like uh, there, there are different tasks to it, but uh, right now I'm just concerned with uh, making it run autonomously. And yeah, so uh, we have a stepper motor for uh, steering, and then we have two linear actuators for braking, and then there will be, we have not decided upon the gear, uh, like changing the gear, but the gear system is quite simple. It's like, it runs on a, it's a, what do you call it, CVT, kind of, and it only has like a forward and a reverse gear and a neutral. Uh, is this electric? Two gear. Uh, it's not electric. It, it runs on a, an engine. Engine. So it's powered by diesel, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, so that's the task that we have right now, and I was just interested in like yeah. collaborating with any of you guys. Are you, is the code base going to be open source for what you're working on? Uh, I guess so, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm working for a university, okay. and it's co all going to be research-based. So we're gonna we're planning to publish everything, okay. uh, and like all the code would be open source, and everything would be open source. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. So sorry. And guys, uh, the uh, the other lurker here is Bill Tyler. Uh, late, so I'll just, uh, mute my Hi, Bill. Um, and Bill, so you, yeah, all right. So you're working on, um, yeah. The so the drones we were talking about the drone applications, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, 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 very nice. Yeah, the just just like the future work, just to, with respect to that. I mean, it seems that the combination of drones, which are available open source technology, with the open source tractor that we're developing. I mean, imagine that your drones s scan your field. Like for example, say you grow in something like cabbage, and or whatever it is, like squash, and you actually want to detect bugs or pests that you can see and detect by computer vision, then you say, oh, okay, I need some Bacillus thuringiensis to spray them, which is a natural herbicide, or, or whatever remedy you have to take, 
It would be excellent. I mean, this is not so far of a cry to to do once we once we get these systems developed. That's which is very interesting in terms of automated agriculture, which could then the way I look at it is distributed agriculture. That this is not no longer relying on mega farms, but small automated operations can now compete with the giants because they're just efficient. So that's that's the vision I'd like to see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a very good vision. Uh, one I share as well, and I'm happy to contribute to. Yeah, it's very helpful. Excellent. Do you do you have any insights? I th think you said there is currently no pest recognition open source projects that are computer vision out there that you know of. So, so I haven't seen any, um, but, I, but I wouldn't swear that there aren't any. Yeah. Um, I'll spend some time digging into it, um, but most of the um, the drone-based aerial crop management stuff that I've seen is all closed source and um, mm -hmm. commercial applications. Yeah. Um, and you know that was kind of where I where I stopped. Um, huh. Right. I it up and tested out a few of them, and then kind of put it away uh, for uh -huh. lack of a multi-spectral camera, and I didn't want to spend a lot of money on. Um, can you elaborate on the pest recognition? I mean, uh, what kind of pests, pests okay. are you talking about here? Okay. Uh, you're growing kale, and okay. you see the cabbage moths on it. Like, for example, we have the the aqua aquaponic greenhouse right here, where where I'm calling from. Uh, we opened the doors in the greenhouse and we had an outbreak of cabbage moths that decimate, that can completely decimate your kale crop. So I went out there with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, and sprayed it and they go away. But something like that where even the drone could, could then recognize it and then, even, then start spraying that with, with just a minor, minor dose. You know, you just need like, you know, only so much. Yeah. So probably even a that, drone could do it. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to add on my project because uh, the project that I'm working on has a second part. Like the second phase of it is detection of weeds. So we, yeah. we are planning uh, to aim for a cornfield. And the cornfield has like three main kinds of, of weeds. Yeah. Uh, they are, uh, that's cockleburr, ragweed, and pigweed. And those weeds, uh, they, they start out like, uh, they start to grow in the middle, like the center of the rows of crops and then mm -hmm. you may even find them like between the amongst the crop itself so what we're planning to do next is to figure out some way to we, we actually are working on it right now uh, a phd student uh, who is senior to me he's working on the detection part of it so we're planning to have uh, we are planning to use um, some sort of uh, neural network to like capture uh, to, to recognize uh, di three different kinds of weeds and yeah. uh, yeah. and then our robot would actually have a functionality to uh, to spray the to spray a I'm herbicide a that is meant to detect the weed so uh, three types of weeds so our, our robot would have three different herbicides uh, <laughs> herbicide tanks on on board and uh, and those tanks, uh, the robot would actually spray from one of those tanks, say, it, 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 say it, it, it I'm sorry, uh, let's say it detects a uh, cockleburr, then, uh, and the cockleburr herbicide is in tank two, so the robot would actually spray herbicide on that weed from tank yeah. two. So that's, that's where we're planning to go. Uh, we're looking at different kinds of neural networks and how we're going to approach it. Uh, one problem that we face right now is if it is a weed in the image, like of the three weeds in the image, or is it a crop, or is it uh, you know just soil? So we yeah. have like five different classes to five different classes to distinguish from. So. It's kind of a tough task, but we're, we're plan uh, so our next step in this project is to we we have access to a greenhouse now. Like recently, uh, like just two days back, we got access to the greenhouse. We have a greenhouse on campus, so we're planning to grow our own weed, <laughs> probably, and, and take like multiple pictures, and 
and figure out if that data set works because the last time we tried to do it with our cascade and the results were like you know 55 percent accuracy which is like not bad but it's not something we're trying to go for we're planning to go somewhere in the range of 80s and 90s yeah uh, excellent stuff. Hey, uh, I actually got to drop off. If you guys want to continue, I've got actually have another person to, to talk to right now. Um, Shao, as I'm talking to Shao right now. Um, Shao, in, in case I'm not sure who actually joined right now on the. Uh, there's a person that appears to have joined. Um, let me see. There's two fellow jitsters and. Three, let's see. I'm having some connectivity issues here. Um, so, um, it's Sohin, S O H I N. Yeah. Okay. I sent you a link to the Slack channel. So, I mean, oh. um, post a little bit about oh, your great. project. Maybe we can find some areas to work on together. Sure, that would be great. Uh, let me just. I don't know. I'm new to this app. I don't know how to. Yeah, I need to figure out stuff, and I literally just got home from work, so. <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. I think yeah. it's pretty cool, the AgBot challenge, is that coming up here in the spring? Is that like March? Is it? Uh, it's, it's in May. Uh, okay. You guys should definitely compete. Uh, I'm here in Indianapolis, and the AgBot challenge takes place uh, up there in Rockville, Indiana. It's like uh, uh, an hour and a half drive from here, but, you know. It's like, it's worth it. And you should take a look. I, I don't know, I seriously need to figure out some way to open up the text channel. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to drop oh, off here, oh, okay, guys. So, uh, need Thank to you. unlock this room. That's great. I'll join you guys. Sorry. Really soon. Um, okay. Well, we're planning on having another meeting uh, next Tuesday, same time, so we can talk about, look more about the project and keep up to date with what's going on. Sure, sure. That would be great. Uh, it was nice meeting you guys. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Uh, hey, um, hey, guys. Um, I was supposed to talk to someone else on the same channel, but I can't tell if the person, Shao, are you on? Here, and if you Jump are, out, say that, um, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. So, uh, I guess I'll stay here, wait for Shao if she's here. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, Matt, we'll right. see you tomorrow. Sounds good. Bye bye. Bye guys. Yep. I'll just join you guys on Slack and I'll see you there and probably I'll, I'll be able to join you all next week for at the same time. Yep. For this meeting. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. We'll, we'll see you next week then. That'll be good. See ya. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.